as a moderator comes speaker, uh, I have an extremely challenging task following on the heels of so much eloquence and passion. Uh, as a longtime student of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, uh, every time I see him, or he's, he even passes me on a, on, a, on a corridor, he'll always whisper, practice, practice, practice. And I think that is the great challenge that, uh, uh, well, let me tell you a, a story. Many years ago, I made a film on an Indian icon called Baba Amte. And Baba Amte was uh, an iconic figure who worked to rehabilitate victims of leprosy. And in a community called Anandvan, he had wrought a miracle uh, with people who, had, who were suffering from leprosy, so much that when you went into that community and you went into, say, the cafeteria, um, we have this sort of awful Indian fashion of, uh, of you know, if someone is serving you water, you just sort of put your fingers in three glasses and carry them together and put them on your table. And we've sort of got comfortable with that. But uh, here were people who had fingers gnarled with leprosy who were doing that. And it was done, it, 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 it's, it's unimaginable, but it was true that because they were so, they were so empowered and there was a feeling of uh, uh, a completeness that you didn't even notice. So I'd done a film on uh, Baba Amte, and so His Holiness watched it and said, you know, this is a man I want to meet. And so it was a day-long trek to Anandan. And so Baba Amte and His Holiness went around the community, and he came back, and both men hugged each other and wept. And I have never seen His Holiness before or since then, weep like he was howling. And at the end of it, he said, you know, Baba, you practice what I can only preach. And as we meet here to reflect on the need and the imperative for interfaith dialogue and the festival of faiths, we do this in the shadow of extremely challenging times perhaps the most challenging since the pre, from, from the Second World War, where there is such a dramatic, powerful, impelling impetus uh, that we need to generate and create to build these bridges between our fates. And I celebrate the Festival of Fates, not only for the intellectual engagement and the opportunity that it has provided for that, but the morning sessions which provide the opportunity and the window to experience the otherness of the other in some ways, that we can then dissolve that otherness and to make that our own. And so I think these are desperate and urgent times where along with our, you know, the need for presence, the need for stillness, I love the phrase, give content to our faith. That is the challenge of our times. And to give content to our faith in a manner that is truly inclusive, where the otherness of the other can in some ways be diluted. What is happening is circumscribed not merely by issues of faith, but powerful issues of equity, of the military, the, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the agendas of militarization, of the weapons industry, of environment, uh, of, 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 of the way petroleum prices can be managed, uh, a whole range of complex issues. And we can only begin that process if even as we pursue our stillness, our intellectual dissolving of the barriers between ourselves and the others, if we can find that impulse to action. And what kind of actions? Louisville is a city of compassion. And I'm, I'm not sure that we often understand why compassion is important, not merely because it's something virtuous or something that's good and, 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 and it will get us uh, 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 
a rapid transit system ticket to heaven. Uh, I think compassion is also a very practical mechanism, a method of training our minds so that there is a softening of ourselves. Today we know from science and, and, and research work of people like David Goldman and, and Richie Davidson that people who have mental problems or who, who have an exaggerated sense of suffering are, are obsessed with I, me, mine. And that and, and when they're interviewed, those phrases come up very frequently. What does training in compassion do? It actually softens the sense of self so that it can be replaced by a proactive sense of concern for others. And the more that we can do that, the more likely are we to be able to address the crises which, you know, for want, uh, for, you know, for our, uh, uh, you know, the, the media's need for, for sort of uh, quick snapshot phrases and titles, we just sort of, uh, we, 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 we paraphrase these as interfaith issues um, as, as, the sh as the shorthand for that aspiration. And I think that His, His, His Holiness's contribution, the Dalai Lama's contribution here has been to bring to the table a long tradition of the most sophisticated mind training techniques that could be adapted in secular contexts removed from their particular religious and sociological context and applied universally so there can be a softening of that. I think there are also learning. We haven't had, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of discussion about about the Hindu tradition here, uh, which is uh, uh, an, an, an ancient tradition and I think the sort of second largest uh, uh, faith in the world, uh, and and and, it, and its inclusivity. And uh, so His Holiness is an heir to that tradition, the Hindu Buddhist tradition, and. Um, the, again, the interfaith, uh, the, the, the festival here has resonances of a very important principle there. Uh, but 200 years ago, there was a, uh, an Indian mystic called Sri Ramakrishna, and um, he was a temple priest. He was considered an avatar, an avatar is an incarnation of God. And uh, he was a temple priest of a Kali temple in the suburbs of uh, Calcutta in Dakineshwa. And um, he, despite the orthodoxy of that time, created a little cottage outside uh, the temple precincts and went in there and lived the life of a Muslim for three days, four days a week, and engaged in the rituals and practices and diet and clothing of a Muslim. So it wasn't just an intellectual, syncretic, understanding in some ways of you know another tradition but the actual experience of it and the acknowledgement that there were diverse realities each of which we had to accept recognize and celebrate as our own and that forms the basis ultimately of genuine interfaith or intrafaith I mean very often we forget that there are there is conflict within faiths itself so it wasn't just Islam, but he did that with Christianity, he did that with Sikhism, and, I, and interestingly enough, his principal disciple, Swami Vivekananda, founded the Ramakrishna mission based on the structures of the Buddhist order. And he had the confidence to say that the Buddha is my Ishta, which means sort of core deity, and Ramakrishna is my master. His Holiness, in, 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 in keeping up with that tradition, and it's an event that we were privileged to organize with him, and it's one of the most powerful memories that I have. You know, when he got the Nobel Peace Prize, I had the great privilege of being with him in Oslo. And soon after that, he, you know, he, he comes out with his check, and, 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 and we're standing there, and he says, wouldn't it be wonderful if the Pope, the Shankaracharya, other religious leaders, you know, a rabbi, a Sikh, and I, could go to Mecca together and pray. This was 1989. And so that was the power and the passion and the depth of his commitment to actually experiencing other realities, the willingness to be open enough 
And that willingness to experience and learn from other realities has also led him to embrace science and the conversation and dialogue with science. And so, in a sense, to explain and validate and deepen our understanding of uh, you know, what quantum physics is telling us, you know, when a butterfly flaps its wings in the rainforests of uh, the Amazon, it affects the, uh, 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 a possible tornado in Bangladesh, is the idea of interdependence. I cannot be happy unless you are happy. And to not only look at that as an intellectual concept, but try and understand what contemporary knowledge is able to reveal and, and, and tell us and reassure us that many of our intuitive understanding and insights have a valid intellectual basis based on reason and logic. Similarly, if today quantum physics tells us that not only is reality or our understanding of perception of reality based on the location of the observer, but the very nature of reality is impacted by the presence of an observer. And so the, big, the minute you can, you can accept that and begin to engage in that, then the very obsession that we have with our own realities and the convictions that we have of our own, the validity and the value of our own worldviews uh, to everybody else, again, softens. So I think what the, 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 the inspiration of the philosophy is really teaching us, as His Holiness says, that each one of us has a different mental disposition. And so we need different mental diets. Just like at, 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 at the human functional level, we all need different diets. Depending on the climate, the culture, our body weight, uh, or, or, or whatever, what have you. So it is that proactive engaging uh, in the acceptance of alternative realities that the minute we can accept that, and the unifying principle that Buddhism offers is that we're all human beings and we all want happiness and to avoid suffering. And each one of us needs a mental diet. And I will just conclude with uh, a, very f uh, a, a hymn that was very dear uh, to uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and that was, Ishwar Allah Tere Naam Sabko Anumati De Bhagawan. And it's very simple. Your name is Ishwar, your name is Allah, your names are many. All of you, each of you, give us equanimity. So, depending on our mental disposition, depending on our backgrounds and perspectives, each of us needs a different mental diet. If we can accept that fundamental principle, that would be an important starting point for not only interfaith dialogue, but the celebration, and that's what I love about this event. It's a festival. It's a celebration of diversity. Because we have long struggled. Very often there are events that happen which talk about tolerance. And tolerance is a very presumptuous, patronizing word. So let us together, in the spirit of Louisville, celebrate diversity and celebrate the mayor who's left uh, for his commitment to the cultivation of compassion that softens our own sense of self that we may embrace the other. Thank you. <laughs>